Hi everyone! Welcome to part 2 of chapter 20. Today we are going to continue our talk on radioactivity and nuclear chemistry. The first thing we are going to do is look at why some of these radioisotopes decay. We're also going to look at uh, how you can tell how much radioactivity you've been exposed to. And then finally we're going to look at some of the kinetics of radioactivity. So lots to cover today. Let's get going. So the first topic for today is the strong force. Okay, so the particles in the nucleus are held together by this really strong attractive force um, that's only found in the nucleus and it's called the strong force, right? If we think about what's in the nucleus, right? There are protons in the nucleus and there are neutrons in the nucleus, but the protons are positively charged, right? And if you think about it, right? Based on Coulomb's law, if we have positive charges right next to each other, they should repel, right? And, and the, the uh, nucleus is very densely packed together. So those protons are really close together. So they should repel each other. So why doesn't the nucleus just fall apart, right? Why does it stay together? If we've got positives and we've got neutrals, you know, why don't those positives just repel? Well, the reason is they're being held together by this strong force. And this really strong attractive force is able to overcome those repulsive forces between the protons, okay? It acts over a really, really short distance, so it's really just only present in the nucleus. Um, and so the neutrons play an important role in stabilizing this nucleus. They add to the strong force, but they don't repel each other like the protons do. So they're just there to be really helpful, right? And to add to the amount of stability in the nucleus. So then, okay, if neutrons are helping stabilize this whole nucleus, right, then why don't we just stick a bunch of neutrons in there, right? The more the merrier. Um, and that's not really how it goes. More neutrons doesn't necessarily equal greater nuclear stability because the, you know, the protons and the neutrons are organized in the nucleus. And we're actually not going to get into that in this class, um, but you can think about them as being organized in energy levels, kind of like how we organize electrons in energy levels. Um, and so if we keep adding neutrons to these energy levels, then eventually we're going to end up having to put them in higher energy levels. And the higher energy levels essentially are, are going to be more unstable. And so then that added stability from the strong force is not really enough to overcome that really high energy state by putting the neutrons in higher energy levels. So there's a point at which, you know, more neutrons is helpful, but too many neutrons is not. So we need to find this like perfect balance between protons and neutrons where we're getting lots of additional strong force, but not any, um, you know, instability from this high energy states, okay? So we're looking for this like perfect ratio of protons to neutrons, and it's not constant, and it's not um, one to one. So this picture on the right is uh, the valley of stability. And all of the little green dots, those are representing, oops, sorry, these are backwards. Um, all of the green dots are representing stable nuclei, and all of the yellow dots are representing unstable nuclei. My apologies. Um, so you can see that the ratio here is not one to one. This line follows one to one. And so when we have, and I'll, and I'll summarize all of this on the next slide, but when we have really small amounts of protons, we want a one-to-one -one ratio from protons to neutrons, essentially. But as we get um, more and more protons, we actually need more neutrons. We need extra neutrons in order to, you know, contribute to that strong force and stabilize the nuclei. But it's all about this ratio, right? The ratio of the neutrons to the protons, super important in, in understanding the stability of the nucleus. And it also tells us what type of decay will occur. So in the last set of slides, we talked about alpha decay and beta decay, right? We looked at all these different types of decay. Um, and so the ratio of the neutrons to the protons, whether it's, you know, the ideal case in which, you know, no um, radioactivity will occur, right? No, um, if it's too high, then we will undergo beta decay. And if it's too low, then we will do positron emission or electron capture, okay? So, but it's all about this ratio. So if our neutron to, you can, you know, Z is essentially protons, that's our atomic number. So if our neutron to pro proton ratio is too high, that means we have too many neutrons. And our, our isotopes will exist up here. They will be above the value of stability, okay? And then we will convert some of those extra neutrons into protons 
via beta decay and get us closer to being a green dot instead of being a yellow dot. Um, and if the, you know, if our ratio is too low, that means it's falling down here, it's falling below the valley of stability, then that means we have too many protons. In that case, we're going to convert some of our protons to neutrons, uh, and we can do this one of two ways. We can either do positron emission, and remember, a positron is essentially the opposite of an electron. Um, it's like an electron, but it's positively charged. Or we can do electron capture. So we can take one of those lower energy electrons that are right next to the nucleus, and we can suck it into the nucleus and turn one of those protons into a neutron. So either way. Again, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix this here. This would be unstable nuclei and stable nuclei. My apologies. Um, but when we have really low atomic numbers, like 1 to 20, okay, so hydrogen to calcium, right? We want um, our, our neutron to our proton ratio to be about 1 to 1. So if you think about carbon, right, carbon 12, um, that's a really common isotope of carbon. It looks like this. That tells us there are six protons, and if we do 12 minus 6, then we get we also have six neutrons. Okay, so that would be a one-to-one -one ratio, and that's stable. When we get a little bit bigger, right, we add, you know, we have more protons, then we're going to want our neutron to proton ratio closer to 1.25. And then as we get a little bit bigger, we'll want it closer to 1.5. And then once we're above 83, pretty much everything is unstable and they're all undergoing some form of decay right that's why you see this line kind of stops um there there are no more stable nuclei uh, so everything is radioactive and it's undergoing some type of decay in order to you know have fewer protons um, so that we can become stable all right, so here's an example. So this says, predict the kind of radioactive decay that magnesium-22 undergoes. So the only way that we can predict our type of decay is we need to look at our ratio, right? And we need to see, okay, does it fall in the valley of stability or is it too high or is it too low based on the number of protons that it has? So magnesium-22, that's telling us the mass of this isotope is 22. Remember, anytime it's written like this, use the mass that's given there, not the mass from the periodic table. So we have 12 protons because this is magnesium, and they all have 12 protons. And then to figure out the number of neutrons, we take our mass and we subtract our number of protons. That gets us our number of neutrons. So for our ratio, we're always going to do neutrons over protons. Okay, make sure not to do it the other way, you'll get the wrong answer. So neutrons over protons, so 10 over 12, we get 0.83. So this is too low, okay? Um, I know you might say, hey, okay, you know, at rounds, that's pretty close. It's not pretty close. <laughs> this is, this is um, we're missing two neutrons here, right? Because we should have a one-to-one -one ratio. So um, since we're too low, we need to convert some of our protons into neutrons, okay? And there, therefore, it can undergo either positron emission or electron capture. And you don't need to figure out which one of those it will do, you can just list them both. It will either undergo positron emission or electron capture. All right, I want you to try one. So uh, here's a practice problem. It says predict whether Krypton-85 is stable or radioactive. And then if it's radioactive, tell me how it's going to decay and the daughter nuclide. So go ahead, pause here, and then come back when you're ready to see the answers. All right, let's go over this. So Krypton-85 has an atomic number of 36, um, all, right, all Krypton atoms have 36 protons, and it has our number of neutrons, we do 85 minus that 36, and we get 49 neutrons. So then we need to figure out our ratio, right? Always neutrons over protons. And so when we divide those up, we get 1.36. And so um, most stable isotopes, when we, we have atomic number between 20 and 40, should be about 1.25. Uh, since it's not 1.25, right, it's too high, we expect this isotope of krypton to be radioactive. Uh, since it's too high, that means it has too many neutrons, and it's going to undergo beta decay in order to turn, you know, one or more of those neutrons into a proton. So there you go. So that would be our beta decay, and now it's turned our krypton into our rubidium. Okay, um, so again, we've converted one of those neutrons into a proton. So you see the atomic number increase, but no change to the mass. 
Um, and just as a fun fact, Krypton-85 is a byproduct of nuclear fission, which we'll look at fission next time. Um, it's re It was released into the atmosphere when those atomic bombs were tested in the 1940s through 1960s. So there you go, fun facts. <laughs> All right, um, magic numbers. So um, magic numbers can also tell us whether our nucleus is stable, right? So one way we do, uh, we look at it is the uh, neutron to proton ratio, right? And that can tell us, you know, if it's one to one for, you know, very small atomic numbers, then that's stable or 1.25 or 1.5, right? Um, but besides that, if we just look at the actual numbers of protons and the actual number of neutrons, that can also tell us whether something is stable. Uh, and most stable nuclei have even numbers of both protons and neutrons. Okay, so if we look at this table, and then I'll go back to this, if we look at this table, right, if we have an even number of protons and an even number of neutrons, right, a lot of those are stable, okay? Um, and then, you know, if you have one of them stable, right, a lot of those are all, uh, sorry, if, if one of those are even, we have a lot that are also stable. Um, but if they're both odd, if we have odd numbers of protons and odd numbers of neutrons, um, those tend to be really unstable. Okay, uh, and so the reason is that if we have these um, total number of nucleons, right, if we add up the protons and the neutrons together and they get one of these um, magic numbers, then the nucleus is more stable. And the reason for this is that the nucleons, right, the protons and the neutrons occupy energy levels within the nucleus like the electrons do in an atom, like I mentioned earlier. Okay, and so we know that there are some uh, numbers of electrons that give us really stable atoms, right? Like if we have helium, helium is two, um, or, you know, if we have eight for any of our noble gases, right? Or 18. Um, so those all give us really, really stable electron configurations. This is essentially the same thing. We have stable numbers of nucleons. And again, since we're not going to get into the, the structure of the nucleus and how they're arranged, you're just gonna have to trust me on this, that these are the magic numbers. Okay, so when our total number of neutrons um, or protons, or either one of them by themselves, the total, you know, a number of just neutrons or just protons is two, eight, 20, 28, 50, 82, or when the neutrons are equal to 126, that makes our atom particularly stable. Okay, um, so a lot of times we'll look at this neutron to proton ratio, but we can also look at the magic numbers to tell us if our nucleus is stable or not. Again, if they're both even, then that's usually going to be a really good indication that uh, we have a stable nucleus. All right, so decay series. So earlier I mentioned that atoms with an atomic number over 83 are radioactive, okay? And they will undergo a series of decays um, in order to become stable, right? They need to get that atomic number under 83. Uh, and usually what happens is that one radioactive nuclide changes into a different radioactive nuclide via decay via decay, and then that will change into a different one, and that will change into a different one, and then it will eventually end up at something that is stable, right? So we start off with a parent radioactive nuclide, and then we get a daughter radioactive nuclide, and then, you know, I don't know, a granddaughter radioactive nuclide, right? And it just keeps going until it hits something that is stable. This can occur via alpha decay or beta decay, right? Depending on um, that proton to neutron ratio. It also usually will be associated with some gamma decay because any of these nuclear changes are always um, giving off some energy, right? We talked about that in the last time, but usually we won't list that gamma decay because it's not affecting our reaction really, right? Our nuclear process. Um, so all of the ra radioactive nuclides are produced just one after another until we reach one that is stable. And that whole thing is called a decay series. So here we are. Um, uranium-238, so that has an atomic number of 92. So that is like way, way, way radioactive because I told you anything over 83 is radioactive. So it can undergo a series of decays in order to reach a stable isotope. So here's our stable isotope. That's lead, 206. Okay, so lead has uh, 82 protons, so it's finally made it under um, that 83 limit and it has a ratio of neutrons to protons that lies in the, in the valley of stability, okay? So it has to meet both of those criteria. Um, so if you'll look here, 
Anytime it's going to the left, that's going to be an alpha decay. And anytime it's going to the right, that would be a beta decay. Um, and as you can see, it undergoes a lot of different types of decay in order to reach um, a stable isotope. So this is what the decay series looks like. All right, on to the next topic, detecting radioactivity. So um, if you work with something that is radioactive, you'll be given a badge and it will measure how much radioactivity you've been exposed to. Um, so this is really common with people like, uh, you know, dentists or dental hygienists, um, you know, x-ray techs. I actually used one in one of my jobs because I worked with x-rays for a while. Um, and so it measures the amount of radioactivity you've been exposed to. Uh, and the way that this can count that, right, is that these particles that are being emitted by radioactive nuclei, they have lots of energy. So we can detect them, right? Kind of like uh, when we were talking about Becquerel and his experiment, those radioactive rays can expose light protected photographic film. Remember, he, you know, used those photographic plates and they developed and he was like, ah, radioactivity. Well, he didn't know that yet, but, you know, that was, that was the whole point of that. Um, we can also use... Um, the same kind of principles to make these badge dosimeters, okay? Um, so these thermoluminescent dosimeters, they contain crystals of different salts, uh, like calcium fluoride. Um, and what happens is when they are hit by the ionizing radiation, um, those energy, those, sorry, those electrons are excited, right? And when they're excited, they jump up to a different energy level. And when they return to those energy levels, they will emit light. And we can see the amount of light that's being emitted. And that would, we would say that that is proportional to the radiation that it's been exposed to, right? Because the more radiation that it's been exposed to, the more, you know, electrons that are being produced and energized. And so the amount of, you know, more energy is being given off. And so more um, light is being released. And again, like I said, we can measure that. So these badges are kind of collected and they're processed regularly to monitor a person's exposure. And if you hit a certain exposure limit, they'll make you work on something else for a while, right? Um, until you can, you know, uh, be cleared to work with your x-rays again. So a couple different ways that we can detect radioactivity. Like I said, one was those badge dosimeters. We've talked about electroscopes already when we talked about Marie Curie, right? With those little pieces of gold foil um, that kind of fall when they're hit with radioactivity. Um, one that you're probably familiar with, or at least maybe have heard of, is a Geiger counter. Um, so this is what they look like, this picture down on the right. And they work by counting the electrons that are being generated when argon gas atoms are ionized by radioactive rays. So our radioactive rays come in here, right? They're, they come in there um, and they will ionize the argon atoms. So argon is a noble gas. It's normally um, neutral, right? It doesn't form ions, but the radioactive rays can ionize the argon atoms. So they will make positive argon atoms, which will release electrons. And those electrons will be attracted to the anode because the anode is positively charged. Um, and so when those electrons, you know, hit the anode, you can have it make a couple different things. You can have it do a reading or you can have it make a clicking noise. And so if you've, um, you know, if you've heard this maybe on like a movie um, or maybe you've, you know, maybe you've seen a Geiger counter, uh, but they'll make like a clicking noise when something is particularly radioactive. So the, each click is corresponding to a different radioactive particle that's passing through the argon gas chamber. So the more clicks you're hearing, the more radioactive something is. So radioactivity is a natural component in our environment, right? It's not um, a bad thing, right? Exposure to too much of it is a bad thing, but it's, you know, it's present everywhere in, in, our, in our environment. There's small amounts of radioactive, radioactive minerals in, in the air, in the ground, in the water, right? We talked about before, um, most things are radioactive, right? There are a lot of radioactive isotopes, um, and it doesn't mean that they are harmful. They are just um, unstable nuclei that will eventually undergo decay, um, some of these radioactive nuclei may even be present in the food that you eat, right? Um, but the, the radiation that you're exposed to just from these natural sources is called background radiation. So whenever we're trying to measure, um, you know, harmful radiation to you, we're not looking at this background radiation that you're exposed to all the time. We're looking to, at any additional radiation that may be coming from a highly, you know, radiating source. So radioactive decay. Um, we can look at how quickly something decays 
right, by looking at the kinetics. And we've talked about kinetics already. Um, we have talked about kinetics a lot in chapter 14, right at the beginning of this course. Uh, and so we're bringing it back now. So everything you know about first order reactions, that will be useful in this section. And if you don't remember it, this will be an excellent review of first order kinetics. Okay, um, but the rate of change in the amount of radioactivity is going to be constant, um, but it's different for each radioactive isotope. Okay, so um, the rate at which carbon-14 decays is going to be different than the rate at which uranium-238 decays. So it's constant for each one of those isotopes, but different between them. Um, and again, we can measure our radioactivity with something like a Geiger counter, um, because that Geiger counter can spit out a number for us. Um, each radionuclide has a particular length of time required to lose half of its radioactivity. Um, so it has a constant half-life, right? So if we you know, look at the total number of radioactive nuclei that we start with and the amount of time it takes for half of those to decay, that is what we call the half-life. And since this half-life is constant, we know that radioactive decay follows first-order kinetics. Okay. Um, and unlike chemical reactions, so this is different from the first order reactions we studied before, the rate of radioactive change is not affected by temperature, right? We know that we can affect, um, you know, reaction rates by increasing the temperature usually, right? If we increase the temperature, we make our molecules move faster, they collide more, we can make our reaction go faster. This is not the case with nuclear reactions. Uh, our nuclear reactions are not affected by temperature. So this, you know, this half-life is always going to stay constant no matter if it's hot or cold. Remember that radioactivity is not a chemical reaction. This is a nuclear reaction and it follows different rules. All right, so our rate is going to equal Kn. So K, if you'll recall, is that rate law constant. Um, so like I said, everything you remember from chapter 14, dig that out of your brain now, this is uh, where it comes in handy. Um, so K is the rate law constant. N is going to be the number of radioactive nuclei. Um, and again, this is going to follow first order kinetics because we don't have any um, subs or superscripts here. The shorter the half-life, the more you know, nuclei that decay every second. Okay, so we would say that the sample is hotter in terms of radioactivity. Um, but this is our equation here. So our half-life is going to equal 0.693 over K. Again, that should look familiar. We talked about that in chapter 14. So if you know the half-life, you could find the rate law constant by using K is equal to 0 0.693 over the half-life. Okay, so both of those will be useful. And then again, radioactive decay is a first order process. So this is our first order equation. The only thing um, that's different here is that I took out, you know, the concentration brackets. Normally it would say like concentration of A is equal to minus KT times the concentration of A naught. Well, instead I've changed these to be N to show that these are the number of nuclei at a certain time um, or the number of nuclei at time zero right, the initial amount. Uh, so you can use these numbers as actual numbers, um, like if it said, I don't know, five nuclei, right, that would be a little bit unusual. Most times we're going to use these in grams or in milligrams, uh, and it doesn't matter which units you're using here as long as they are the same. So if your NT is in milligrams, make sure your N0 is in milligrams. Um, but otherwise, you can use uh, different units and it will all work out just fine. So here are some of the uh, half-lives of different nuclides. Um, you know, some, like I said, are really, really long. So this is thorium-232 has a super long half-life. Um, but if we look at, you know, thorium-219, then it has a really short half-life, okay? Um, so different nuclides have different half-lives. Um, but again, it's always going to stay constant no matter how much of it you have, no matter the temperature, right? Doesn't change. So half-life means that half of the radioactive atoms decay um, in that given amount of time. So if we, you know, say we start with 100% uh, percent of our sample. After one half-life, that means we have 50% left. And after another half-life, that means we have 25% left. And after another half-life, we have 12.5% left, right? Each time we are dividing by two, um, we're dividing, sorry, the amount that we have left by two, okay? So that's why we're seeing 
um, this type of curve rather than something that's linear. So here, same kind of curve, right? This exponential decay. Um, so again, if we start with, you know, 60,000 uh, at time zero, then after one half-life, which is 2.7 days, right? So that'd be somewhere, I don't know, here. So after one half-life, that means we have half left. We have 30,000 left. Um, and if we did, you know, another half-life and we did, you know, 5.4, right? We would get um, to where we have, again, about half left. Okay, so each time after each half-life, right, depending on how long that is, we are going to have, um, you know, another half of it remaining. All right, let's do some chapter 14 review. So this is an example problem for our radioactive decay. So if you have 1.35 milligram sample of PU 236, calculate the mass that remains after five years. And so we have the half-life of 2.86 years. Okay, so again, we have our two different equations, one relating the half-life to K, and then one that relates the amounts to K. Um, so either way, we don't have K, so we need to solve for it. Um, the easiest way to do that would be to use that half-life to calculate the rate constant. So we know that our half-life is equal to 0 0.693 over K. So we can go ahead and rearrange that, right? We'll switch our places of our half-life and our K. Um, and then we can, you know, plug in our, our, our half-life value, 2.86 years, and we can get our K value. Then we can use our integrated rate law equation to solve for the amount that's left. So again, this was our initial amount. We just solve for our K value, um, and then our time value is five years. So we can plug all of that in and solve for the amount that remains at time zero, or at time T. Sorry, I've dropped the T here, um, but at time T. Uh, and then again, just do E to you know both sides, and that will get you your answer. Always double check that the amount that you start with right, is the, you know, higher than the amount that you are ending with. I know that sounds silly, but what happens is that sometimes people will drop this negative. It's really easy to drop, uh, and they'll end up getting, you know, more after their radioactive decay. Uh, if you'll recall on the last slide, right, we should always have less as time goes on because our sample is continually undergoing decay. Um, so you're never going to, you know, run to a situation where you end up with more. You're always going to have less. So always make sure this number is bigger than, you know, this number when you're doing these calculations. Uh, and if it ends up being larger, what happened is that you probably dropped that negative. So here, this answer makes sense. Um, we are left with less than half of the original mass because it's been longer than one half-life, right? We have 2.86 years um, and, you know, it's a half-life and we're looking at how much is left after five years. So it should be less than half of the sample, right? We have almost two half-lives than that have gone on. Um, it should almost be a quarter of the initial sample. All right, you go ahead and try one. Radon-222 is a gas that's suspected of causing lung cancer as it leaks into houses. This is actually, just a side note, a really big problem back east. Um, I used to live in Pittsburgh, and uh, you know, every so often, I think every year or two, you're supposed to get your basement checked for the presence of radon. I had never even heard of this until I lived in Pittsburgh, but this is a normal thing that people have their basements checked for radon. Um, so just so you know, it does, it leaks in from the ground via uranium decay. I thought this was crazy, um, but there you go. So in this problem, assuming no loss or gain from leakage, if there's 10.24 grams of radon-222 in the house today, how much will there be in 5.4 weeks? And then you have the half-life there. So go ahead, pause here, uh, try this one out, and then come back when you're ready to see the answer. All right, let's go over this. So the first thing that we need to do is use that half-life to calculate the rate constant, just like we did last time. Um, so there's our, our equation. We can rearrange it to solve for k, plug in our half-life, and get our rate constant. And then we can use our integrated rate law to figure out the amount that's left. So we have, um, we need to change our weeks into days to match our rate constant, right? We started, uh, you know, this is, you know, our half-life is in days, so we need to make sure our total time is in days. So there you go, 38 days, and we can plug that into our equation, just like we did before, do E to the both sides, and get our answer. 
Again, this makes sense because the length of time is about 10 half-lives. So we had, you know, our, our half-life was 3.8 days. We were looking at 38 days. So 10 half-lives have happened. So we divided in half 10 times. Um, so it should be a fairly small amount of our sample left. All right, radiometric dating. So um, the change in the amount of radioactivity of a particular nuclide is predictable, right? It's constant, and it's not affected by any environmental factors. So it's not affected by temperature, it's not affected by the amount of your sample, it's just going to continue to decay at a same rate. So by measuring and comparing the amount of apparent radioactive isotope and its you know, daughter nu nuclide that's stable, we can determine the age of the object. Um, we can use you know, half-life and the equations before, and we can figure out how old something is. Again, using this ratio of how much we started with via, or, you know, compared to how much of the stable one is now present. So there's a couple different ways we can do this. You can do um, mineral dating. And so that will compare the ratio of uranium-238 to lead-206, right? We saw that decay series before. Uranium-238 goes through a ton of alpha and beta decays and eventually ends up at lead-206. And lead-206 is stable. So we can compare the amount of uranium-238 to the amount of lead-206 in like rocks and meteorites and things like that. And we can figure out how old something is because we know the half-life is 4.5 billion years. That is a long time, but we can use that to figure out how much is left. You can also do a similar kind of process by comparing potassium-40 to argon-40. Um, and using all of this, we can estimate the age of the Earth um, we can, you know, do that using both of these two different processes, the uranium-238 and lead-206, or potassium-40 and argon-40. Either one of those dating processes give us the Earth's age to be about 4 and or 4.5 billion years old. Um, but the estimated age of the Earth is inconsistent with the estimated age of our universe by about 13.7 billion years, if you estimate it via the expansion rate. Um, so that's super interesting, but again, that's going to be a problem for a different day. Um, but we can use these processes of radiometric dating to look at things that are really old. Um, so these ones, these mineral dating, we are not going to get into much in this class um, because it's kind of similar to carbon dating, which we're going to cover in a minute. Um, but this is used to study things that are really, really, really old, like the Earth. Um, carbon dating, though, is used to date things that are old, but not as old as the earth, old stuff on earth. Uh, and the way that we do this is we know that all things that were alive once contained carbon, okay? Um, and we have three different isotopes of carbon. One of those is carbon-14, um, and that's what we use for carbon dating. And so carbon-14 is radioactive, uh, and it has a half-life of 5,730 years. So we can um, you know, look at the amount of carbon-14 that is present in a really old sample of something and compare that to the amount of carbon-14 that it had initially when it was alive and we can see how old something was. This half-life is not super long, okay? Uh, I know it still seems long, right? You know, 5,700 years, but that's not, that's not really, really long. So we would normally expect a radioisotope with this relatively short half-life to have disappeared a long time ago right? Um, because the age of the earth is older than that. But atmospheric chemistry keeps producing carbon-14 at nearly the same rate that it decays. Uh, and here's how it does it, okay? So in the atmosphere, we have nitrogen, um, and we have nitrogen-14, which is a really common isotope of nitrogen, and the nitrogen gets bombarded with these neutrons, right? And as it keeps getting hit with neutrons, what happens is that nitrogen-14 ends up being turned into carbon-14, okay? Um, and so when that happens, oh, sorry, these are upside down, my apologies. <laughs> um, so when the nitrogen keeps getting hit with the neutrons, the nitrogen-14 gets turned into carbon-14 and a little hydrogen atom will float away. But that's how we're producing the carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Okay, so we're continually producing carbon-14. So even though it's decaying at a fairly good rate, we're getting more and more of it. So the amount, uh, the rate at carbon, sorry, the rate that carbon-14 is being produced is about the same as the rate that carbon-14 is decaying. So we have a fairly constant amount of carbon-14 at all times. 
Okay, so this carbon-14 is going to be used to make carbon dioxide in the air. Okay, and so when that, you know, that carbon is used to make the carbon dioxide, then it gets absorbed by the plants, and then, you know, some things eat the plants, and then we eat the animals, right? And so we are also ingesting carbon-14 all the time. So the amount of carbon-14 that is in you is, stays fairly constant, um, and so we can look and see how old, you know, like a fossil is compared to how old or sorry, how old a fossil is by looking at the amount of carbon-14 that's present in that fossil versus the amount of carbon-14 that would have been present in the original animal that was constantly ingesting sources of carbon-14. Because once the animal dies, now it's not getting more carbon-14. That carbon-14 that's present is just decaying. Okay, um, so we can look at the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 that's present in a fossil versus how much is present in a living animal to see how old something is. Um, and again, we'll look at the, you know, the, the half-life of carbon-14 to do that math. Okay, um, this is typically used to estimate the ages of fossil, other old artifacts, um, but the limit for the technique is about 50,000 years old. So we can't estimate the age of things that are really, really old, um, just things that are, you know, kind of kind of old. Um, and the reason for this is that after about nine half-lives, um, the amount of carbon-14 that's left will actually be below the background radiation. So then it doesn't mean anything. Um, it just ends up being noise. So here's an example. So if we look at something that is living, so that would have 100% of the carbon-14 that something normally has. So therefore, you know, it's zero years old. Um, you know, you might be, you know, you might be, I don't know, 18 years old right now, but in, in terms of, you know, how long, I guess, how long you've been dead, uh, it would be zero since you're still alive. Um, it's kind of a weird way of looking at it, but there you go. But if, um, you know, if we drop to 90% of the normal carbon-14 value, then that would be 870 years old. And again, they do those calculations based on the half-life of carbon-14. And so you can just go ahead and keep, you know, looking at, you know, the ratio, how much carbon-14 is left. Okay, well, if only 40% of the carbon-14 is left that should be there, then that thing is, you know, 7,580 years old. Okay, so again, super cool. Um, this, you know, carbon dating, it's a really neat way to figure out how old something is, and it always goes back to these first-order kinetic reactions and half-life. So that's it for today's lecture. Uh, we covered a lot of different topics today, um, but I think it's all really, really interesting. So again, we looked at um, the different types of decay that a radioactive nuclei can undergo. Um, so we looked at why it might undergo these different types of decay. You know, does it have too many neutrons? Did it have too few neutrons? Um, those will be different types. We also looked at, you know, how do you see how much radioactivity you've been exposed to using those dosimeters or maybe a Geiger counter. Um, and then we talked about carbon dating, which I think is really neat um, because I, you know, I think I think fossils are really exciting and all of that. I don't know. Maybe I secretly want to be Indiana Jones. Who knows? Um, but that's it for today, guys. So keep working hard. Make sure you review all of that information from uh, chapter 14. If you're, you know, if you've forgotten a lot of your kinetics, this is a good chance to review it in preparation for the final because the final is getting kind of close. Um, so keep working hard, get lots of practice on those problems. As always, if you have any questions, please send them my way and I am happy to help you out. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys next time.